So welcome everybody to our webinar. Um, today we are going to talk about the path ahead after the winter storms that hit Texas and several other states um, in the past week. Our thoughts are with everyone who is impacted by the storm. And at SDP, we are marshalling our resources and working with our partners to help support a swift and effective recovery. We hope that webinars like this are never needed but hope that the webinar or that the information in this webinar and the tools that we share today will help to make navigating the recovery process and the days ahead easier for everybody who was affected by the storm. For those of you who are not familiar with SVP, we are a national nonprofit whose mission is to shrink the time between disaster and recovery. We um, accomplish our mission or seek to accomplish our mis mission by helping individuals who are affected um, by disasters through providing rebuilding support. We've been offering rebuilding support in the Houston area and in the uh, Brazoria County area since Hurricane Harvey. Um, in 2017, but we were founded um, after Hurricane Katrina in 2006. Um, in addition to rebuilding homes, we seek to share our best practices that we have learned with other organizations and with individuals to make the recovery process smoother for anybody um, who has to go through those steps. So what I am going to share today is an overview of the different resources and programs um, as well as tips and recommendations from our clients and other disaster survivors that we have learned over the years of working with them. We're hoping to offer some understanding about the disaster recovery process, avoiding common pitfalls, and recommendations for things you can do to maximize the resources that are available to you. Everything that we're going to cover today is available um, in a resource guide for free um, at our on our website at scpprotects.org. Sorry, it looks like I have a note from somebody that they have a hard time hearing. Can, are, is anybody else having issues hearing with the, the sound on the webinar? If you're, if you're having a problem or if the connection is bad, uh, please just shoot me a message. Um, okay, it looks like everything is good for most folks. Um, I'm sorry if you're having issues. It may be um, your connection. Uh, thank you for those who have um, who have responded. I really appreciate that. Um, for those who are, or for the individual who is having a problem, I'm, I'm sorry for the for the concern, we are recording this session, so I will share it with you after, and I can also address any questions that may come up um, that you can't, if, if for something that you aren't able to hear properly. Okay, so um, everything that we are going to cover today um, is available um, on our website at scpprotects.org in a resource guide that you can download at no cost. Um, so, no worries if you miss something, please feel free to access that resource guide to, um, to reference anything that we discussed today. To get started, I wanted to share some words of wisdom that our clients have shared with us regarding the recovery processes, process. So, these are just some tips to consider as you're moving through the recovery process. The first is, you are your best advocate. When you're looking into resources, talking to um, available um, providers or available um, individuals that have resources to offer, be specific about the loss that you had and the need that you had and, um, so that you can get the resources that you need to help address those needs that have, have come up for you. Second, you can and should appeal any and all decisions that you don't agree with. If you feel like your insurance claim is too low, if your FEMA award is denied, or if your SBA loan is too low, immediately have conversations with those organizations, appeal those decisions, and advocate for the funds that you uh, feel like you need for your recovery. The third is document everything. 
taking pictures, um, taking videos of the damage that you have, keeping copies of all communications and forms that you submit will just make it easier down the road if there's ever any questions about the process or your application process with FEMA or your insurance or SBA. Having backups is critical because things get lost in the shuffle. And if you have a form that you submitted, it means you can easily access it and, and resubmit it to them without any additional delay. And also keep at it. Recovery is a marathon, it's not a sprint. It can be complicated, it can be frustrating, um, and it, it can take so much longer than, than you have the patience for. Uh, but it's really important to be persistent, to keep appealing, keep following up, to advocate for your recovery. And finally, take care of yourself. Um, this is a process that can really um, cause a lot of stress and be overwhelming for a lot of um, individuals and their families. It's important to take pauses um, for deep breaths, try to um, spend time with your family, spend time doing the things that you love with the people that you love um, so that you um, prioritize yourself um, as a part of the recovery process. So today, um, what we're gonna discuss is what to expect in the days ahead, um, best practices for filing for insurance, best practices for filing for FEMA, federal assistance, um, different tips uh, that you can employ when going through the cleanup process, as well as the repairs and rebuilding process. Specifically, we're gonna focus on red flags and things to consider when hiring a contractor to avoid contractor fraud. Like I said at the top, all of our resources are available at svpprotects.org and all of the content we're gonna discuss are in our recovery guides at that website. Um, so please feel free to visit that website and download those recovery guides for free. So first I'm gonna provide a little bit of background about what to expect in the days ahead. Um, so here are some high level considerations um, for your disaster recovery process. The first is um, once your immediate needs are addressed, so as long as your, um, your health, your safety, uh, your health and your safety are considered, um, take the time to do an initial damage ass assessment in your home. Document your pictures, document with videos, so that you have um, documentation of what it looked like immediately after the storm. The first step then is to um, call your agent, um, your insurance agent right away to file for the insurance claims um, that you have available to you. As soon as you file your insurance claim, you don't have to wait for a decision, register with FEMA and other agencies for disaster assistance. Um, Continue to document all damage inside and out. So be comprehensive about um, looking at the interior of your home, the exterior of your home, along with different possessions that you may have um, that may have been damaged. Um, once it is safe to do so, and once you feel like you have fully documented the damage in your home, begin cleanup um, in a way uh, that is safe for you and make temporary repairs to prevent further damage. Both FEMA and your insurance will expect you to put, place, or put repairs in place um, to prevent any additional damage to your home. So if you have a leaking pipe, take the steps to, to stop the leak so that there's no further water damage. Move forward with at that point in getting contractor estimates um, and repairs um, for your repairs. Um, at, don't proceed with the repairs yet, but you can use those estimates and conversations with FEMA and insurance as a way to demonstrate um, the damage that you had. And finally, you'll move forward with your inspectors, both with FEMA and, and insurance, and then move through the claims process to receive the assistance you need and move into rebuilding from there. So there are several different sources of funding that can help you as you move through those different steps of recovery. The primary source is your home insurance. By law, federal assistance cannot cover losses that are already covered by insurance. So it's important to move through that process so that FEMA and federal assistance can be informed by the coverage that your insurance has. There are two primary programs for federal assistance. First, 
um, the FEMA Individuals and Household Programs, which is grant funding for uh, expenses that are not covered by insurance for those affected by disasters. And also the Small Business Administration's Disaster Home and Property Loan Program. This is a low interest long-term loan that is available for homeowners who are looking for additional funds to make repairs or resilient improvements upon their home. Finally, charitable organizations also offer support through um, providing funds, goods, and services. Um, and 211 is a great place to start if you're in need of charitable, charitable assistance to learn more about what um, specific offerings there are that match up with the need that you may have. One thing that's consistent across all of these programs is that there is an application process for each of them, and all of them require a series of documents and paperwork to go through that application process. So as best as you can now, take the time to compile this information and documentation so you're prepared to move forward um, as you move into the application process. Some very commonly requested documentations are things that um, verify your identification. So things like your driver's license, license or your social security cards, things that verify your home ownership or occupancy. Um, so your housing information, your mortgage, um, utility bills, or your lease if you're a renter. Um, things that verify your insurance, financial information, um, especially for assistance programs that are based on uh, your, your income, financial information will be really important. And then also, as I've said before, um, having documentations for the damages caused by disaster um, is very important as well. And another thing to consider before you start really moving into the applications and repairs is considering your, um, your current um, existing financial obligation. So many um, businesses that you have you know, ongoing payments with, so your mortgage or credit card company or other loan or utility companies will work with you if you are um, a disaster survivor or if you have been impacted by the storm. It's just important to reach out early before you're behind on payments to let them know of your situation and work out a plan with them. So take the time to consider your financial obligations that will be coming up in the months ahead. And if you have any concern that you won't be able to meet them, reach out now um, so that they can be managed ahead of time. So, with that kind of introduction of an overview of what this process looks like, we're gonna move a little bit into the insurance process. So we'll talk about the claims process of filing your insurance claim, along with tips for working with your insurance company. So your homeowner's policy really um, depends upon your your individual policy. So every policy is different depending upon your home, your carrier, and even when you, you purchased your policy for your home. So um, it's important to take the time uh, to reach out to your insurance company as you're filing the claim or before you file the claim and ask uh, questions to learn more about what your coverage is so you can make sure that you're maximizing uh, the policies and resources that are available to you. So first, um, ask what your policy covers. There are some really obvious um, things that your policy will cover, like damage to your home, but uh, homeowner's insurance often covers things like debris removal or disaster-related needs. So if you um, had to replace the food in your refrigerator, um, or if you had to purchase um, gas for a generator, or if you had to purchase water, um, those are things that could be covered by your homeowner's insurance. So think about all of the expenses that you had and ask your insurance agent if they're covered when you go through your claims process. Also, um, because this is a covered peril, because the winter storm is a covered peril, your insurance will likely cover additional living expenses. So ALE um, can be accessed immediately without an, an inspection of your home and can be used for immediate needs as 
uh, such as temporary housing. So if you have immediate needs uh, that need to be addressed, reach out to your insurance agent, explain um, what those needs are, and um, ask if they would be covered under your additional living expenses. And finally, it's important to ask your insurance agent what information they need to file a claim so that you can document all of your damage appropriately and avoid any delays um, down the road in the process. So as you're moving through the process of filing the insurance claim, it's important to start early. So contact your insurance company, start to have those conversations right away. Uh, we are seeing in Houston that there are, is a delay of about two to four weeks for an infection just because of the scale of this event and, and the scale of it across Texas. Um, so taking that time to call now to kind of get early in the queue um, can really uh, help to expedite. If you have a mortgage company, reach out to your mortgage company as soon as you talk to your insurance company as well to involve them in the process. Um, any uh, benefits that go to you that are for the structure of your home may have to be funneled through your mortgage company um, because they are kind of technically the owner of the title of the home. So having that conversation with them early can make sure that there's no delay in that process. Any funds that are for content damage will go directly for you, but those are just for funds that go to the structure of your home. As I've said a handful of times, you can tell it's really important by the time, amount of times I've repeated it, take photos and record um, your damage. Be very comprehensive and keep all of your receipts um, to make sure that you're keeping records of everything um, that happened to your home as a result of the storm. So, um, while you're going through this process, it's important to take reasonable steps to prevent further damage in your home. So like I mentioned before, if there's a delay in filing or in filing your claim or if there is an inspection, take steps so that there's no more damage incurred before you um, are able to receive the funds to repair your home. Document everything um, in terms of conversations and interactions um, with your insurance agent. So if you have a call with someone and they, you know, give you a time frame of when they're going to get back to you or if they ask you to submit another form, make a note of who you talked to, what the request was, and when you followed up so that if there are any questions down the road and you happen to have another person answering the phone, you can easily convey that information without any confusion about what was said or who said it. It's also important to get written estimates from contractors who may be able to repair your home as soon as possible. As you're moving through the claim process, this will help to demonstrate to your insurance company the cost of uh, your repairs so they can appropriately um, settle your claim. This is important in Houston right now because there is such a demand, or in, in Texas as well, um, because there is such a demand for contractors, we are seeing a little bit of surge pricing. Um, you know, this isn't necessarily price gouging, but it's just that the prices are aligning with the increase in demand in the market. So by having written estimates, you can demonstrate to your insurance company that, um, you know, their standard cost that they may use may be a little bit lower than what's needed because of this increase in demand across the state, simply due to the scale of the event that we're seeing. And finally, work very closely with your claims adjuster. If you have questions, call them, email them, be persistent in getting the, um, the, need, the resources that you need. Don't be afraid to ask for additional coverage if you feel like it should be included. If you think of something after your first conversation, you know, it's not lost pick up the phone and ask them to add it to your claim. It really is a conversation with your insurance company um, and they'll be willing to kind of hear more and get more information as you have that. And having a close relationship with your claims adjuster can make that go a lot smoother. And in the same vein, don't feel rushed to settle to, with the first amount they offer or um, if there's any, uh, if, if there's any questions with the with the um, settlement, so the initial settlement that they offer is not 
um, your final settlement. Um, you, can, you can appeal or you can ask them to consider more funding. Um, and if you discover additional damage down the road, so say you do some repairs and, and you find out later that there's something else that you missed, um, and you failed to mention to the insurance company, you have up to a year to file a supplemental claim to get um, more resources for your recovery there. It may seem like a good idea to use funds for other purchases, for other needs that you may have, but we really encourage you to use your funding to fully repair your home. Um, in working with clients, we also find, we all, we commonly find individuals who receive the funds to recover, but then had another need um, that they use those funds for, and they were still living um, in a disaster impacted home. So if you have additional needs, um, and, uh, you know, need additional support, please reach out to 211 or organizations like FTP to see if we can connect you with additional resources to meet those needs and use your insurance settlement to rebuild your home. And finally, if you have disputes with your insurance agent if it, or insurance company, if you're not able to um, uh, kind of build that relationship and settle it on your own, there are available resources for you. The Texas Department of Insurance um, is a great resource for support um, and guidance. They are um, supporting as, as those affected by the storm. And I was on a, on a call earlier where they said they're answering calls within 20 seconds. So if you have um, questions, do not hesitate to call them. Disaster Legal Aid is another great resource to um, help with any concerns if you think, um, you know, that there has been an infringement of your rights or if you need guidance on what your rights are um, in this situation. So with, with um, that on insurance claims, I'm going to move into um, federal assistance. So as you all know, there has been a major disaster declaration for um, over 100 counties in Texas. Um, and with that de declaration that opens up individual assistance for those affected by the storm to be able to file for resources for their recovery. Um, by federal law, FEMA resources cannot cover what's covered by insurance. So in that process, you'll have to demonstrate to FEMA that you have unmet need that has not been able to be addressed by your insurance coverage. Um, this chart kind of guides you through each step in the application process. I'm going to talk through each step um, in the slides ahead, so I'm not going to go through this in detail, but just want to show you, you know, show you this just to show that it's kind of a complicated process, um, but there is a method to it and FEMA is a great resource. So as you're going through the application process, as you're um, having questions, you know, don't hesitate to call um, the number um, or reach out to FEMA um, to answer questions. SVP is also always available to support in your application process. So the FEMA Individuals and Household Programs um, cover all um, disaster cause needs that are not met by insurance. So this is related to both housing um, damage. So um, if you need repair, repair or replacement of your damaged home, along with temporary housing assistance if you cannot stay in your home. There's also other needs assistance available for any for other additional needs that, or additional expenses that you may have incurred um, as a part of the as a part of the, the winter storm. Um, one thing to note is that um, this program is meant to bring your homes back to a livable condition, which is not the same as your pre-disaster condition. So the max award around, amount is about $34,000, um, and uh, you'll only be given funds to bring your home back to a safe, sanitary, and secure um, condition, so it's safe to be in, but it may not be in the exact condition that it was um, before the storm. And what, so safe, sanitary, and secure, safe, sanitary, and functional, what does that look like? Um, so just a couple of examples for appliances, FEMA um, may assist in the replacement or repair, repairs of disaster damaged furnaces and hot water heaters. 
Um, depending on your home, they may not consider um, appliances such as a dishwasher. Um, for ceiling and roof damage, um, they may assist to repair leaks in the roof um, that damage their ceilings. They may um, help with electrical components um, that may uh, be damaged by flooding, but they may not support um, repairs to remove stains from, the, from leaks on your ceiling or in your paint. Females often um, will replace um, any disaster damage floor or windows, anything that's structural, but anything that um, may be a little bit more aesthetic um, may not be considered. So when you're talking with FEMA, be um, very explicit about the needs that you have about the damage to your home and explain um, why it affects the safety um, and sanitation of your home so that um, it's more likely to be covered under this condition. For those of you who may have applied for um, FEMA assistance before, um, it may look a little different to you this year um, thanks to COVID. So um, it's very unlikely that a FEMA inspector will come to your home. All inspections um, or almost all inspections will be done remotely over the phone through a video call. So depending on the resources that you have, FEMA will um, talk to you on the phone or Zoom or FaceTime. However, they can best connect with you um, to to do the inspection on your home. Um, when you are um, applying for FEMA, you will be asked to indicate the level of damage on your home. It's important to be honest, um, but really don't underplay the damage on your home. If your home is damaged, um, if you cannot live in your home, or if you feel it is unsafe to be in your home, it's very important that you say that because that will move you um, to the front of the queue uh, to schedule that um, inspection as soon as possible. So if your home was destroyed, if you have severe damage in your home, if you, if you do not feel like you can stay in your home, please make sure you say that. For those that have minor damage, if you feel like you can live in your home, um, but you would need support down the road, um, FEMA will follow up with you um, to schedule a remote inspection. And it's important to um, answer that call or respond very promptly to get that scheduled to move it forward, because it may be a little bit down the road um, as the urgent cases are will be considered first. So moving into what does this the FEMA process look like. So once you file your insurance, um, you can register with, for FEMA, and you can do that on disasterassistance.gov or by calling their phone number 1-800-621-3362. Um, FEMA will reach out to you to um, assess uh, the damage on your home um, and schedule a remote inspection. So depending on the, the assessment of your damage, or what you self-report, that scheduling may be sooner or later. Um, so it's just really important to be clear about the full extent of damage that you have. Um, like I said, that, that inspection will now be a video call. They'll talk you through a series of questions to determine the damage. In that video call, um, make sure that you show them um, all of the damage that you have. If you feel like the videos aren't demonstrating it, or if you made some temporary repairs, um, show them the pictures and videos um, that you took immediately after the storm to really show the full damage that you had. Be thorough, take your time, um, and don't rush. It um, may be possible at this point that FEMA would recommend that you apply for an SBA disaster loan application. Um, it is important to go through this process and file um, for SBA if you are referred um, through FEMA. You aren't required to accept it if you, ap if you apply, um, but that your application may make you eligible for more FEMA grant funds. So if you don't apply, it doesn't open up kind of that second bucket of FEMA um, funds that could become available. Once the inspection is complete, you will receive a decision letter um, from FEMA, and you really have three options. So if you are happy with the award, if you feel like um, it meets your needs, you can accept the amount um, and you will receive that, um, that funds in a transfer to your bank account or a check. 
If you feel like the award is too low or if you are denied, it's very important that you appeal. So FEMA really views uh, denial um, as the start of the conversation. It's really, it's a way for FEMA to move the case forward. So you may get a denial letter um, saying that we weren't able to prove that you had insurance or we weren't able to prove whether or not you had insurance coverage for that. And that just means that they need more information about your insurance. So you can file an appeal and say, you know, I'm responding to this denial letter. Um, and here are the you know, here's the information that you need regarding my insurance. That will open your case back up and move you back through the process. So often we see people get a de denial letter and they, you know, toss it out and get discouraged and, you know, look for other resources. So um, really it's important to be persistent and keep pushing through that FEMA assistance process, read the denial letter, understand what the denial reason is, and appeal that reason with the, um, with the resources that FEMA needs to move forward. In our resource guide um, that we have, um, we have very detailed instructions about how to file a FEMA appeal along with a template of a letter. So um, as you're going through this process, you know, feel free to reference that disaster assistance guide um, to, to provide you the, the, the framework for filing that appeal. SVP is also available, available to provide appeal support um, if you feel like you need an additional hand. And I know I've said it a couple of times to make sure that you're persistent in this process, but just to underscore that with a FEMA appeal, the average homeowner appeals their FEMA uh, decision three to five times after a disaster. So I know it can be frustrating and it can feel like it takes forever, but going through that process um, can really open up a lot of additional funds for you um, in your recovery if you just prove the damage that you had and go through the process that FEMA has. And finally, um, for FEMA, just wanting to share um, some additional tips um, on, on dealing with FEMA. When you talk with FEMA, um, when you provide information to FEMA, keep notes on all of your conversations. So document who you talk to, when, what you talked about, um, and really create a record of everything that you talk about, all the requests they make of you, and how you followed up. Um, again, similar to your insurance, this becomes useful as you're um, having, you know, questions down the road. If you speak to another FEMA person, you can quickly reference that without any confusion um, about the process that you had. Also keep extra copies of all of your documents. Um, FEMA is going to ask for receipts. They're going to ask for invoices, estimates. Um, make sure that you keep a copy for yourself. Um, things do get lost in the shuffle so that you have them if, if there's ever a question down the road. Um, you are able to request your file from FEMA to see what information they use in making um, their decision. So when you're going through the appeals process, don't um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to FEMA and say, hey, I'd like to see my file. Um, if, there, if your denial was rated, related to your insurance, you can see what insurance paperwork they looked at so that you can supplement with additional information. Um, just like with your insurance uh, claims, disaster legal aid is a great resource um, for not just your um, FEMA applications, but also your appeals. SDP is also always available to support. I mentioned SBA loans before. So if FEMA refers you to um, uh, the SBA loan program, it's really important for you to apply. Um, eligibility in the SBA uh, loan program can open up um, additional federal assistance. Um, if you don't apply, that additional federal assistance may not um, open up for you. So these loans um, provide assistance to homeowners and renters um, in a declared disaster area through a low interest long-term loan. Um, and so this is, a, again, intended to cover damages that aren't covered by your insurance um, in the event that you didn't have full coverage or you're underinsured. Um, these uh, loans are available for um, homeowners, renters, condo associations, um, and can be used um, for, for rental units 
um, but not for secondary homes. If you're interested in making additional um, resilient repairs to your home, so say um, you're looking to kind of do a more resilient piping in your home, or if you're looking to elevate your home, you may um, be eligible for additional funds to make those um, resilient repairs to your home. All right, so that was details re regarding all of the FEMA application process. I know that there is a lot of information that I'm covering. Again, um, we are available to help. If you have any questions in this process, please don't hesitate to reach out to SVP or go to our website and download our resource guide that covers all of this information for you. So as you move into the cleanup phase, I'm sure a lot of you have already started to clean up your homes. Um, wanted to make you aware of some uh, uh, resources in our community. So Crisis Cleanup um, has a hotline that you can call um, to register if you need assistance in your home. And what Crisis Cleanup does is they will match you with a um, participating organization that is providing those services in your area. So these are free um, repair services um, through nonprofit organizations who have mobilized to support individuals affected um, by the storm. So crisis cleanup is just one example. 211 is another resource in the community to identify resources um, that may match your needs. Um, but we really share this to emphasize that um, it's important to uh, clean up your home for safety and sanitation reasons, um, but look for free resources through nonprofit organizations or um, you know, through your church groups or other volunteer organizations to save your recovery funds as best as you can for the rebuilding that you have um, in your home. When you go through um, the cleanup, um, I know I've said this a couple of times. I hope that underscores how important it is. Um, document um, all of your damage in your home um, before doing any cleanup and repairs. Um, if you have to gut your home, um, if you have significant damage to your floor, to your carpet, um, to your windows, and you need to um, you know, dispose of those uh, materials, um, keep a sample of them to show your insurance inspector. Um, this will um, make sure that your insurance coverage um, can, uh, it will cover the quality of materials that you had in your home before the disaster. If you throw everything out and aren't able to show the quality that you may have, there's no guarantee that they'll replace um, or provide you the funding to replace at the same quality that you had before. If water entered your entered your home, um, please take the appropriate steps to, steps to prevent damage from potential mold. I know we're it's a little bit different than hurricane season here in Texas. It's not super hot out, but mold is still um, a threat to our homes. And and even if you don't see it um, yet, it could um, this that could be a long term concern if it's not dried out properly. So um, please take the time to dry out your your home um, and. Uh, remediate any mold that you do see. And also make reasonable temporary repairs to prevent further damage if you are waiting for recovery funds um, from your insurance or FEMA down the road. So I know I've said this one before as well, but we don't, you know, you don't want to compound the damage in your home by not addressing um, some small concerns uh, that could prevent for future damage. So just a little bit more detail on the mold. Um, I know in Texas, this isn't an unknown to a lot of you, um, but mold must be remedi remediated and addressed before any repairs and rebuilding begin. And, and mold grows on and below surfaces and materials like wood. So it's important to do a very comprehensive treatment of mold before moving forward with any repairs and rebuilding. On our website, we have a free guide um, that guides you through the mold remediation process um, and can, um, we also have a guide for the resources that you may need to purchase at, um, you know, at the hardware store to go through that process. So we really encourage you to um, remediate mold um, with, you know, with your friends and family, if you have the support through a volunteer group, if you can, because mold is something that can be done 
um, pretty, uh, it can be done DIY, but it can also be very expensive if you go through a contractor. So this is a really um, a good spot to save some recovery funds and, and do this one on your own if you are able to. And when we talk about repairs and rebuilding, um, just want to share some best practices for um, protecting your recovery funds. So protecting those funds that you re receive to rebuild your home. So first, um, look for, if you are in need of support, look for any programs that are out there um, that provide um, free repair assistance in your area. Again, 211 crisis cleanup are great places to start. Um, you can always reach out to SVP and we can connect you with other um, organizations or if SVP is offering those services to address um, repair assistance if it's not something that you're able to do on your own with the recovery funds um, that you see uh, or that you receive. Um, so use good practices um, for selecting and working with a contractor. I'm going to provide some details on that in the next slides, but contractor fraud, unfortunately, is very prevalent after a disaster. Um, and so we just want to make sure that we don't lose our recovery funds to a bad actor. Um, we do live in Texas, so consider ways to build more resiliently. If you can invest in, you know, resilient windows, resilient roofs, that may um, save you recovery expenses down the road. Um, continue to document all of your expenses and keep all of your receipts through your rebuilding process. So your insurance company, like I said, you can have um, up to a year to file a supplemental claim for additional expenses. So if you do get to the point where you you're spending more funds on your recovery than you received from your insurance agent, you may be able to go back to them and say, hey, I've spent some more um, in the same categories in which you covered me before and talk to them about um, getting additional coverage for those expenses. So as I mentioned, um, unfortunately, contractor fraud is very common after disasters. And, and what this looks like is individuals um, coming um, and, and offering to repair, rebuild your home um, and not uh, providing you with any service or with subpar service, which leads you in the position where to having to do additional repairs to your home with no longer or no longer having the funds to do so. So um, on our resource or on our website, we have a free resource guide um, that details red flags to look out for and a checklist to use when procuring a contractor so that you can ensure um, that you are moving forward with a safe contractor um, to use. So things to consider when you're <laughs> hiring a contractor is first, um, you know, Look at, conduct a smart search for contractors. So talk to family and friends, look at the um, Chamber of Commerce, look at the, look at that BBB, and make sure that the contractor that you're calling um, is somebody that you would trust and comes from somebody that you would trust. As best as you can get three written estimates for material and label, labor costs. This will help to ensure that if you get, get one, that they're not um, you know, charging you more than market rate. Um, this may be especially hard right now because of the demand in Texas, uh, but do, you know, have as many conversations as you can with contractors to get an idea for what a reasonable cost is. You know, things to consider, things to look out for, some red flags, you know, don't work with a contractor who is soliciting door to door. Um, if somebody will not share with you their ID, their license, or their insurance information, um, if somebody asks for you to um, pay up front before any work is completed, um, or if somebody asks you to sign over your insurance check to them, you know, that's a big red flag. And also, if somebody asks you to um, pay a deposit um, to hold your place in line, um, if they say, hey, I'm really busy, but if you give me, you know, X amount of dollars, I'll come back and, you know, and make sure that your, your job's completed by the end of next week, you know, that's a big red flag that, um, they're going to take that deposit money and, and not return. Other things, um, you know, I mentioned the ID and, and license and insurance. So when you hire a contractor, get um, copies of this information. Um, you know, a, a contractor above the board will have no problem sharing this information uh, with you and you can validate their license um, 
information on uh, the texas.gov webpage for both the plumber and other contractors that you may need. Also ask for references um, of work that the contractors have completed um, in our area or in the state. We often see contractors coming in from out of state um, who have no work experience. That's a kind of a red flag that they're coming in to capitalize on the disaster and may not be acting above board. So ask for references and call those references to make sure um, that it's somebody that you would wanna work with. When you're working with a contractor, um, it's important to have a written contract um, that both of you agree on. Um, only sign once you both agree, you understand um, everything and you understand the time frame. Never pay up front. Um, and we strongly recommend to pay as progress is completed on the home. So in that contract establish, I, you know, check in points where, you know, either based on inspections or based on work completed at which you'll pay um, the contractor. Um, and never pay your final payment until all work is completed and the job has passed inspection. So that's contractor fraud. I know I covered a lot of material. Um, so, you know, just for a recap, we talked about filing insurance claims, filing for FEMA, um, things to consider with SBA, and then contractor fraud and cleanup um, considerations for disaster recovery. So um, if anyone has any questions at this time, um, feel free to unmute yourself. I know I'll, some, Questions also came into the chat box. I will um, go through those questions now as well. Um, and I know that we have 12 minutes left, so we may be able to get through these questions. Um, I will stay on the line for as long as um, y'all need to answer any other questions um, that may come up. So, um, so first question, will these slides be, be made available to participants? If so, um, how soon after the meeting. Um, I will be sending out these slides um, to everyone on the call um, before the end of the day. So sometimes there's a little de delay in getting the attendance report, but as soon as I get that, I'll be sending these slides out to everybody. The second question is, as long as someone in the household has citizenship or legal status, the home can be eligible for FEMA financial relief. That is correct. So if you have any questions on that eligibility, you can call FEMA to confirm, but that is correct. As long as somebody in the household has citizenship um, and that can be a child, you are eligible to apply. So if the next question is, if I have home insurance, but if the expense, ah, so if my cost of repairs to my home is the same as my deductible amount, so, you know, technically I wouldn't get any funds for my home insurance, can I get help through FEMA? Unfortunately, no, in that case. Um, FEMA does not consider your deductible an unmet need from your insurance. So, um, kind of, I, I think I said earlier, you know, FEMA only covers needs that are not met through your insurance company. So they do not consider that deductible amount as unmet. So that would be ineligible. However, um, you may still, you are able to apply for FEMA through, through those other needs assistance, um, that other category besides home repair. So think about any other expenses that you may have occurred that you can um, apply uh, through FEMA for. Um, so the next question is for our email address. Here it is, so training at svpusa.org. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate um, to shoot us an email there. We'll reply as soon as we can. Um, we will be hosting this webinar um, daily for at least the next um, three weeks. So, um, you know, if you want to listen again, if you want um, to share uh, this training with somebody else, please refer them um, to go ahead and call in to one of our um, other trainings that we'll be having. Um, let's see. Any, okay, I see a couple more questions coming in. 
So another question, can FEMA cover deductibles? Um, again, no, unfortunately, um, FEMA does not consider your deductible an unmet need. Um, and Another question, if they were not, if you were denied by your insurance um, or if your deductible is too high, can you apply for FEMA? So if you were denied by your insurance, yes, you are eligible to apply from, for FEMA. If your deductible is too high, um, you know, that, that is not a covered expense. However, you still really encourage everybody to apply for FEMA. So even if you feel as if your deductible amount is the only amount that you need, um, you can still, um, you can still apply for FEMA and go through that process and share with them that that's your concern. And there may be, um, some additional resources that can, they can support you with. Um, one more question for our address. So our address is sbpusa.org, um, email address. <laughs> or, so email address is training at sbpusa.org. Um, our website is svpusa.org, and the website that I mentioned, svpprotects.org, has all of our downloadable resource guides. If you go to svpusa.org, it'll take you um, through a link right there as well. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, oh, so I got another question. If my insurance does not cover water damage, can I still apply for personal property damage? Um, yes, you can. However, um, because the water damage in this case um, was caused by the winter storm, you still may be eligible. So if you do not have flood insurance, um, you don't need flood insurance for this because the cause of the damage was not rising water. It was caused by um, the low temperatures and power outage. So, um, you, so you still may be eligible for um, insurance benefits because of that difference, because we're not dealing with a hurricane, um, we're dealing with this winter storm. So, um, it's important just to call up your insurance agent. Every policy is different in how that is handled, um, but most insurance companies um, are not classifying this as a flood event. Any other questions? Okay, that looks like it. So thank you again, everybody, for taking the time to join us today. I know that I covered a lot of information. I'll follow up with the deck um, and feel free to um, reply with any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you so much and have a great day.